So the fifth and final part of this unit three of um, uh, the files topic is all about trying to make your file handling code a bit more robust. And this is particularly important because files are particularly error prone. Uh, you're more likely to have problems with files than um, uh, I've been mean, assuming your, your program code is written correctly. So otherwise correct code is more likely to have problems with files. And the reason for that is because of a number, a number of reasons. So um, files intrinsically are a little bit unreliable because if they're being stored on a, an actual hard disk, then well, the hard disk might fail. Um, if they're being stored on a USB key, the user might have ejected the USB key. Um, even if that doesn't happen, you don't know that the file that existed um, five minutes ago when your program started still exists now that you want to come to read it. Um, in the meantime, another program might have deleted it or overwritten it or the user might have deleted it or who knows what's happened to it. It may not exist now. Uh, and even if it does exist, another program might have locked it so they can busy write it. So Excel is the classic example for this. Excel loves locking files. So as soon as you open the file in Excel, it generally becomes almost impossible to read it with anything else because Excel said, no, no, I'm not letting anybody else touch this file because I'm using it. Um, and even if you can read it, um, what's the guarantees that it's in the correct format? Um, so it's always a good idea to add extra error handling to try and deal with all of these problems. So the first type of thing you're going to worry about is dealing with problems if you're trying to read or um, open that file. So this is where the user's ejected the USB key um, before your program's had a chance to read it. And these things nearly always return an I.O. error. Um, so the I.O. error is basically the operating saying, system saying, uh, no, something went wrong with this. And the way to sort these out is to put the code within a try accept block and then have an accept I.O. error. Uh, and then decide what you're going to do about it. So this is how you go about doing this in the code. It's still the same example. And you can see that we have a try and that's got the, the width and everything else in it. We need to put the try before the width because the width open is going to be the thing that's going to throw an error. If that file is not openable, doesn't exist, not readable, um, then that's the point at which it's going to throw the error. So the try has to go outside that. Um, and then we catch the IO error. And then, of course, it's a question of what you go and do about it. Um, so as a general rule, uh, if you cannot recover from an error yourself, so if you can't, if you, you can't code your program to deal with the error, then uh, you should uh, pass the error on to whichever bit of code called your code. So the way to do that is you should raise um, an exception. So you should either simply re-raise the, the same exception, I'll show you how to do that in a second, or maybe better, you should raise a new exception that tries to give as clear a, a, a error message and error code as possible. Um, so this is the approach we've done here. We simply raise an IO error and we try and provide a more informative error message. So in computing one, you may have been taught to try and use sys.exit. Um, this is actually a really bad idea. Um, generally speaking, you shouldn't use sys.exit unless you have a really good reason to know why you want to be doing sys.exit. Um, as a general rule, you should assume that all your code is being used by somebody else's Python code. Um, maybe it's your another bit of your Python code. And the correct thing to go and do is simply carry on saying, oh, no, we hit an error. So that just in case that the code that called you, um, your code can, can fix the problem or can ignore it or decide it doesn't matter. Um, only do a sys.exit when you know that you are the master controlling program in charge of everything. Um, and in this module, that's basically never. Um, so um, the other thing we've got in there you'll see is that we have um, uh, an else clause. So if we didn't catch the exception, um, then um, we, we can simply pass it on. Um, now, if you do want to re-raise that exception, um, then uh, you're going to do it something like this. So um, uh, you have whatever try block is, you catch the exception um, uh, and you use uh, accept whatever exception it is as a variable name. I tend to use err, but you could use whatever called error, my error, bad error, whatever you want to call it. Then you simply do raise and then that variable name again. So as I was just saying, I have this particular example, I've got an else clause there, 
that else clause is going to only going to run if there was no exceptions at all. So if, if the the try block found no problems, um, then we're going to get to the else clause. Now, actually, it's a bit redundant in this example because the only way you could ever get there is if there was no problem. Uh, but in other situations, you might have um, decided that a certain type of exception didn't matter. But on the other hand, it also means you haven't managed to read the file correctly. Um, and so in those situations, you would you, you would use the else clause as well. So that deals in the first case just with uh, the problem of if the file doesn't exist, it's gone away, not readable, whatever else. You also need to think about, well, what happens if it doesn't have the data in the format you expect? And again, this is the thing about just trusting or not trusting that data is, is how you think it should be. So um, this is where you have to sit down and think about various problems you might have. Um, so in this particular case, let's pretend, well, let's assume that one of the things we might find is if we don't have a line that starts data in square brackets, we never find the, the start of the numerical data, um, in which case that's a not good. That's definitely a problem because what use is a data without any data? Um, then another problem you might have is we read the column headers. We, we should know, therefore, the number of columns. But what happens if the data has a different number of columns? So we should probably go and flag that up as, a, as an error and try and at least report that, that there's something wrong. And then the other thing is that, OK, well, it might um, have uh, uh, some columns of data, uh, but what happens if there's no rows of data there? Um, so in that case, we want to go and throw uh, uh, an error there as well. And then finally, um, in all of these things, well, what happens if Jen from TXT can't work out uh, what, how to go and convert the data? into a nice two-dimensional array of numbers. So figuring out all of this adds quite a lot of lines to the code, but it's still relatively understandable. So it looks like this. OK, so um, you can see we've still got the, um, the, the, the for loop there um, with the break. It's all inside the try. So we've still got the thing that's going to catch the, the IO error. The, the new stuff all happens. Um, after we've tried reading the data with Jen from TXT. So first of all, we're checking to see, well, is this data we've read from Jen from TXT actually got two dimensions to it? Because if it's not two dimensional data, it's not got rows and columns. So let's go and um, uh, make note of that. So I'm going to raise a runtime error. So I'm going to use runtime error to mean that there's something, although the file is perfectly legal as a file, uh, I can't work out how to read it. Um, so that's one problem. Then the next one we say, well, is the the, the uh, second item in the in the data shape, which is the number of columns, is that not the same thing as the number of column headers I've found? Because if that's the case, then there's a mismatch between the number of columns of data I've got and the actual number of headers. So again, we're going to throw a, raise a runtime error with that. And then the final thing I'll go and do is I'll just check that I do actually have some rows of data. Um, and it might be that for you know, your application, you decided that you had to have at least 10 rows of data, in which case you could check that um, if, if data.shape um, zero, which is going to be the number of rows, is less than 10, then clearly you've got a problem and you raise another runtime error. So then we now have three lots of accept clauses because um, we're going to do slightly different things with each one. So first of all, we have an accept runtime error as error. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert that runtime error and turn it into an I.O. error because I want to say, well, I.O. errors are basically there was a problem reading the file. Um, and I'm going to give it a more helpful error message. And I'm going to include actually the, the error message that came with that runtime error. And that's going to be the, the message I've defined. Um, so things like data did not have rows and columns or whatever it is. Um, and then the next thing we're going to look for is a value error. So a value error is what Jen from TXT is going to give me if it can't cope. And so again, I'm going to convert that to an IO error and raise a more helpful error message that's saying it was a Jen from TXT and to give some idea of what actually happened there. And then finally, we've got our IO error clause again, and that's the same as we had before. Um, that just says, oh, the operating system had a problem. Um, and here's the original message. Um, You'll see in all these cases, I'm converting the, the error exception to a string, um, and that will just give you the error message out of it. And then finally, I have that else clause, which, as I said, the else clause is a bit, um, a bit redundant since you could only get there if there were no exceptions, but it does no harm. Uh, and we get there with 
uh, without exceptions, and it then will do what we did beforehand. So that's now got a very full example of how you go about building in different checks for does the file exist, but also does it make sense? Is it what you expected it to go and be? Um, and so it, it gives you a, a fairly robust way that, OK, it might not be able to do anything about the problems, but at least it's going to tell you what the problem was in a sensible sort of way. Um, and so um, hopefully whatever called your program can then go and take some suitable corrective action. That might be simply as telling the user, I'm sorry, I can't read that data file, pick a different one. 